Hi, everybody. This is Martha Creek. You can contact me at marthacreek.com. There's also hundreds of videos and podcasts and resources there that are offered to get empowered teachings to the whole of the planet, which is my vision and my mission. And I'm doing that in service to people that serve. And I'm very, very blessed to get to spend my life with the coolest people on the planet and people that are about something. And I believe if you're listening to this or watching this, that you're about something too. So you're not about what I'm about. You're about not what my beautiful friend here, Reverend Chris Jackson's with me today. You'll get to meet him in a minute. He's about something too. And the purpose of this mentoring moments with Martha is to look at what we are about, whatever you're about, and to uplift it, to find an empowered energy for it, to get some inspiration about it, and then Godspeed in whatever way you are serving and how you're serving. And I love hanging out with people that I believe live on purpose and live with purpose. And that is how this is offered today from our gratitude for that. So blessing be, and thank you, Reverend Chris Jackson, for being here with me today and taking the time out to do this. So My pleasure, Martha. It's a joy. Um, what about... Think about the time that you've spent, your life, the decades that you've spent as a leader, identified as a leader, leading organizations, Unity Worldwide Headquarters back in the day. Now, um, one of the largest, most thriving Unity ministries there is in the movement down Unity on the Bay in Miami, Florida. And speak a little bit about um, that journey, like what called you, what you believe if you, that you've been assigned some purpose, um, purpose as described by um, you're growing yourself through all this time, you grow yourself, that it was not like you arrived somewhere or checked it off like a tick box exercise, and that you're confident and clear that as you grow yourself and do things that benefit yourself, your own soul's progression, that you're also benefiting others that you're beneficial to the whole. So speak a little bit about it, your, your certainty of that, your clarity of that. Um, sure. It started for me at a very early age because I grew up in Unity, down at Unity on the Plaza in Kansas City, Unity Temple. And uh, I knew I wanted to be a minister when I was 12 years old. So it's like in, on some level, the ticket was already signed before I even arrived on the planet, I think. And I'm grateful for that. I wouldn't trade my uh, unity upbringing for anything. And yet at the same time, part of being in unity for me was having a rebellious and adventurous spirit, one that wouldn't always fit inside the box. And that led me through and continues to lead me through all manner of uh, unusual um, activities and so forth. And um, so it was, a, it was a strange road uh, from the time I entered college um, and got really wrapped up in a lot of, uh, I'll call it adventures that were outside the box. And some of them included drugs and partying and all kinds of things. And then I came back and um, in the process of putting myself together, landed a job as a tour guide at Unity Village. That was 1975. And that was the beginning of my 26 year career there. I remember early on, I had an instructor who was also a dear friend. He was an uh, an instructor to me personally, but also uh, in the Unity Ministerial Program, and his name was um, Dennis Nagel, Reverend Dennis Nagel. And I remember I had just been appointed, I think it was my first leadership management position at the village, uh, director of the visitor center, a manager of the visitor center there, which had just opened in the base of the tower back in those days. And uh, he said to me once, uh, because I, I aspired to be a great leader and a great minister and he said to me just remember always lead with love mm -hmm. and i got it back then to a degree but that statement has stayed with me through the decades in times most especially when as we all do i think certainly i have questioned my competency um my deservedness my ability and so forth and it would just keep coming back to that lead with love lead with love and oftentimes it would be like, well, that's not enough. You know, I've, I mean, I need skill sets. I need this. I need this. But what I'll say is that statement has proven true. 
that when I am coming in whatever role I've played, when I am coming from a space of as much love, non-judgment, uh, non-condemnatory judgment that degrades myself or anyone else, anyone else, most especially myself, however, that I'm fine. I'm, I, I get what I need. I, the skills that are required come. So that statement has been very powerful, powerful to me over the years. And, and you know personally that my road, even at Unity on the Bay in the last 15 years, has not been uh, just paved with roses. There's been a, a number of thorns in the way. And yet I would keep coming back to that statement, um, most especially with those who I believed were in any way offending or persecuting me. And it always lifted me above sometimes what would seem to me and to many others insurmountable challenges. So I don't use the word a lot um, for several reasons. Like I, I get these harebrained ideas sometimes about I'm going to not use that word and see what other word I could use. And I believe it's misunderstood what love is. So if you didn't use love in your analogy here, what word would you replace with it to lead with? Oh, there's so many words I could use and they would probably all fall into the same category as love because, you know, they're, they're used for so many different reasons, joy, peace, um, but the one that really rings for me most often would be gratitude. That Because I know that when I'm in a space of love, I'm in a space of gratitude for whatever it is that's going on. So gratitude, appreciation, thanksgiving, awareness of the gifts that are always before me, even in the most trying of times, you know, and they're always there, but so often overlooked. So to me, the loving individual is the individual who can look at all the content of the screen of their projection of their own consciousness. And, and, and that's the non-judgmental aspect of it too. I'm not going to judge this because I can't, you know, I, I, I had a merging of course in miracles and unity a number of years ago. And, and I really have come to appreciate judgment. You shouldn't, well, excuse me. It is not necessary to judge to become a more spiritual person it is necessary to avoid judgment because I am not capable of making it. I'm just not capable. So if I'm in a space of love, I'm in a space of appreciation for everything that is on the plate. Yeah. You used a word that's very powerful to me. Thank you. I was reflecting too. It's like, how would I answer the question? It was, it felt like presence lead with presence, which is what you're describing to leave with awareness, to leave with allowing, 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 which I love hearing you say. And some of my best teachers, my favorite teachers over the years was like, it's simple. Now, girl, it's simple. Mm -hmm. Allow, allow, allow. <laughs> like, well, it sounds simple, but yeah. in the meantime, people are like trying to take me down over here. <laughs> but in the meantime, I've had a threat to my profession or in the meantime, somebody's not included me in their party. Yeah. It's no little thing to, to live from that. So, it's not to me. And to me, allowance is the same as non-resistance, yeah, which is yeah. the same as non-judgment. I mean, you know, all of these terms are just yeah. the best human effort we can make yeah. to try to communicate what really cannot even be communicated, probably. One thing you said, Chris, was like including ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I be really actually believe that, that I, I don't, I'm at a place now that I believe it's where it all is. So that the healing we're seeking, the reconciliation, the renewal, this uh, any notion of abandonment is self-abandonment, rejection, self-rejection. So you shed light on that here as you say that, that this unconditional love, this open-hearted agape kind of love has got to include ourselves and not from a narcissistic, <laughs> I'm the center of the world kind of place, but like a real compassion uh, for ourselves. So speak about that, like what your understanding or your belief about that is or your experience. Um, sure. Uh, I'm so appreciative of this. I just have to say that after all those words of appreciation, I love every moment that I spend with you. So let me remember the question that you posed. Uh, can you just throw it out again in one? We'll speak about in your reference to this, uh, this love and leading with love to include myself in that love. Yeah. And I believe it's the crux of it. 
Um, so speak about that, whatever yeah. you think about that. And interestingly, you know, as ministers, I think our inclination, maybe our initial motivation was, I want to be here to spread compassion to everyone, understanding. I want to show up for everyone. I want to show up for the world. I want to give, 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 give without really recognizing or always being fully mindful that that process does have to begin with us. And so you can be out as I have been out on many occasions, serving and helping and, and, and seeking to get people to accept themselves when all the while <laughs> I was not accepting myself. You know, um, I remember a number of years ago, I, I, in a talk that I delivered, I said something about my tendency toward um, feelings of inadequacy or incompetency. And someone came up to me after the talk and said, I would really prefer if you would not any longer speak about your inadequacy and incompetency in your talks. And I thought, but I don't speak about that all that often, but I really was. I was communicating that because it was a reality inside of me. And of course it still is even sometimes on the best of days, but I'm with you all the way in the sense that it's not until that internal um, identity, understanding and relationship is clean and healthy that I'm really gonna be able to do the work I wanna do. So to me, at the risk of sounding self-absorbed or selfish, it's, it's got to start with me. And I do think, and I've noticed this, especially during this pandemic, I, I believe I'm getting a little clearer on those moments when I'm out of tune with myself, when I'm not supporting myself. Energetically, I just feel it more. Um, and while on some days that can be a little uncomfortable, it's still a beautiful thing because it's the, it's the signal. You know, if I'm feeling this way, then there's something inside of me that's calling for a healing in my relationship with myself. And when I use the word relationship with myself, I am, of course, talking about my relationship with God or the broader uh, identity that I'm an expression of. Yes. And thank you for that. So if any of you listeners, we're not promoting our way. We're simply sharing our own experience. So if God is not your word, then use whatever your word is. And if Christianity is not your slant, then use your slant, use your scriptures, use whatever you use. So this is like, can be applied though, regardless of what your religious beliefs are, or certainly any philosophical or religious beliefs that we can look at what we're pointing to here is a chance to reflect as compassionately to treat ourselves with as much love and compassion and understanding as we're wanting to extend to others and wanting to express to others or wanting to see others do for themselves that it, while we're not doing it and the irony of that, that we're in preaching it, teaching it, writing books about it without ever applying it to, to a new depth. Thank you for that, Martha. You know, it re I think I had a conversation with you in fact, once upon a time in one of our encounters where I was talking about at this point in my ministry, um, and I'm not speaking about unity on the Bay I'm t or even the unity movement. I'm talking about the ministry of my life. I am really feeling guided and it's a little awkward. I'm feeling really guided to utilize a more generic or inclusive vocabulary. Um, like for example, uh, I've been working on a book and I, and I don't want to call God, God. So I've been, you know, asking, well, what should I call it then? And the answer that most recently has come to me is uh, infinite intelligence and creativity. Um, because I think the moment that we put, and that's still a label, but the moment that we put labels, especially that have historical associations, I mean, God for some people is a beautiful word and for other people, it's not. Yes. And I get that. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what you're going to come up with. So what's your purpose? And why we say, I wanna, I'm, gonna, I'm writing a book or a book's writing me. What for? What do you believe it's for? Well, it's interesting. It's been evolving now for like 35. Actually, it might even be 40 years now because I started as a goal setting uh, modality. And in the 1990s, 
when I was praying to be a great spiritual leader and my life fell apart at the seams, which was very, very confusing, I realized you know, that we only have so much control in terms of I'm going to set this goal, I'm going to strategize my way toward it, I'm going to achieve it, and I'm going to feel good about that. Into, and again, to quote Course in Miracles, I cannot perceive my own best interests because I was getting everything I wanted, and it turned out at the end of the, at the, end of the day, it wasn't at all what I wanted. So that has reframed the, the book now from a goal-setting book to a whole different modality, which I'm calling value-driven living. And what I'm encouraging is that rather than seeking to achieve, accomplish, or obtain anything external, it's about getting in touch with and, and being honest with what we value and offering some tools on that because so often we will espouse to the world, oh, well, you know, I value uh, charity and I value unconditional love and oh, oh, and. And that's what I would, what I call professed values. But it's not until we get down and start looking, where are my resources going? What's my calendar say I'm, I'm investing my time in? What does my bank account say I'm investing my money in? And then we start to really have to get honest because there is typically, if not always this gap between what we're uh, professing is so important to us and how we're actually living our lives. And I think that's an energy gap that inhibits um, productivity is not exactly the word, but that it, it, it just inhibits us when it, it keeps us from taking all the energy that's being made available to us and moving it with clarity, peace, power, and poise toward what we're really wanting to be about. So, and I've taught this in a couple different formats. Every time I do, it changes. So that's made the writing a book really difficult because the, the moment I try to put it in, stone, it won't go there. But I can say that I believe that when a person gets honest, and this is not about good, bad, or right, or wrong, just getting honest and saying, all right, this is what I value. And, and that's where I am. And that's okay, because it's obviously where I need to be. Now, is there anything that I would like to engage in that would help me to become clearer on what I will call the values of my heart or the heart's longing or the heart's desire and how I might totally by free will, not out of some sense of social rightness or something, but in what ways might I want to realign my values? And you can't do that, of course, until you've honestly looked at what they are right now. But then I've noticed once you do that, you can make much more conscious decisions about what you're doing in life that can bring you gradually into greater alignment with the desire, the longing of your heart and what you really value. And that is, I have found richly rewarding work that begins with myself, but it's also great to see other people when they have those aha moments and think, I didn't even realize that was important to me. And I didn't realize how its importance may have been impacting another arena of my life or another value that was actually more important to me. I'm not sure yeah. if that's making sense, but it's clarity. Perfect sense to me. And it sounds like you're writing my book. So go ahead and put. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, co, we'll co-author. It's exactly what I believe. It's so in alignment with that. And you've got a kinder way of putting like your professed values. And I'd call it your BS. <laughs> <laughs> to be your values that are not your values because we didn't look to see we didn't examine with with clarity with focus we we didn't see that that's that was handed down or that's in the culture or that was in the family or that's that was in somebody else's convictions even a marital conviction it's not my conviction it's not what i'm about it's not what i'm going to look back on my deathbed and go yippee oh my right. That was a great use of the resources I got to facilitate and to then to say at any day then to wake up to that, to say yeah. if I can't look back on it and my tail wag, that I'm delighted about where it is, then there is a gap in resource, there's a gap in energy, there's a gap, an incoherence, an incongruity, an, uh, and for me it's out of integrity with my own soul, my own mission to say yeah. 
that I can't look back on that and be proud of that, then I've got to close that up to say that um, and to quit saying that. So then that money then is directed towards something that I yes. value and that I do want to leave in place and that I do want to be a contributor to a supporter of. So um, this, I'm delighted about this. So keep teaching it, of course, as you write it to see how it would morph into that. And I'll offer a disclaimer here. It was some of this that Reverend Chris is talking about that caused me to look back at how much I was spending at hair care a few years ago and thought, uh, uh, all that money that's going for hair care ain't going for hair care no more. Cause I don't care. And look what, look how I ended up. So if you start to really do this kind of deep introspective work, you may start coloring your hair. And if you value coloring your hair, you get to color it. See, yes. you get to color it. See, this is not about giving up something that makes your tail wag or gives up. Or, or, nobody's no, nobody here in this podcast is asking you to give up anything, but to say, to get clear about what am I, what, what, where is it going and what is actually true for me? And this BS of professed value is BS to a degree. So what is it I'm actually valuing? Yeah. There's, there's a great quote from uh, um, Gandhi when he says, in so many words I'm paraphrasing, never give up a thing until you want some other thing so much that the thing no, the previous thing no longer has any value for you. Mm -hmm. And I have found that that is the way my evolution has worked. It's like, um, if I try to give up a value, if I, I'm not coloring my hair, but most people think I do. Um, but if I try to give that up before I want something else, like for example, authenticity or something, or I don't want chemicals in my hair. Um, if I try to do that, then I'm forcing, then I'm using personal will, as opposed to just waiting until that moment, which always arrives, where, ah, I want this more than this. And then it's almost like it's an automatic attraction. Or it's magnet. beautiful. Not only is it an attraction, then there, you wouldn't have the sense of loss or right. grief over it. Like, oh, I had to give up or I had to set aside. It's like, no, you don't have to set aside. You found something that was more interesting to you or had more value to you or something that you'd be prouder about. Then I have to give up my value of sacrifice, which is not a value I'm proud to say that I have or have had, but it's a reality that somewhere along the line, somebody told me, if you're going to be worth anything, you're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to give up and it's going to hurt and it's going to be painful and you're just going to have to walk through it and get over it. And it's like, I need to look at that value of sacrifice. And all of our values. So yeah. stay tuned in then to see what else we can look at here. So I was thinking about then how many years, decades, have you been in um, leadership with Unity? And I love that you referenced your life as ministry, Chris, which is what's true. So if you're listening to this, your life is ministry, whether you're involved in a ministry, a church, a community or anything, life, your own life, your individual life is a ministry. So beautiful, beautiful to hear that. And then regarding leadership, then in ministry, church leadership, organizational leadership, how many years have you been at it? Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> Probably about... 30, I've been an ordained minister for 30 years. I was in leadership roles prior to that for about 10 years. Yeah. So you read 40 as far as how long it's been with this book cooking. So that's yeah. the number. So like 40 years of this. So speak about then in terms of best practices, what you can say, I was able to make it 40 years through intense situations, life dissolving and creating happening simultaneously many many spiritual breakthroughs and understanding a lot of life happening around you through your own family and ministry and other things so what's been your staying power so what would you put forth here for others regardless of the profession they're in regardless of their calling in life or their life's ministry what could you say that would be an indicator of uh, these are things that matter. This is what I did. So I asked one of the ministers in a, another interview, she's been a minister for 36 years. And she said, well, one 
sometime way in my early in my career, a man told me who was clergy. I asked him, how have you been clergy so long? Like, this is so hard. Like, I've only been at it a year or two, and I'm really doubting it. And he said, well, it's like this. I stay when I want to, and I stay when I don't want to. And I stayed when they wanted me to, and I stayed when they didn't want me to. So I stayed. So what would sum up, or what could you say about your staying power of 40 years in a leadership, particularly in a leadership role? The word that comes to mind is trust. Trust, trust, trust. And I go back to my new terminology for God, the Almighty, the Divine, whatever. Uh, infinite intelligence and creativity is always at work. If it doesn't seem that way, it's only because I've closed my awareness to that. Um, and I'm also going to say loyalty. I, I think, I'm sure there are people that would laugh at this, but I think I'm a pretty loyal person. Uh, so I'm loyal to organizations. I mean, I was 26 years at Unity Village and I've been 20 years in field ministry now. And um, I think part of, you, you talk about staying, stay, stay. It's just, it comes naturally to me. Sometimes that's been just a great blessing and sometimes I've wanted to abandon it. But I feel like if I'm in, I'm in for the long haul. Um, yeah. So, and, and then so loyalty can, or, and loyalty, not just to organizations, but really loyalty to this infinite intelligence and creativity. Because it, you know, we're studying a book right now at Unity on the Bay called The Universe Has Your Back by Gabby Bernstein. And to me, that's what it's all about. Trusting in the building of a, re of a relationship of loyalty, mutual loyalty between yourself and whatever you perceive the divine to be. And letting that lead the way, which to me is the life of a minister. I remember um, this was, God, back in the late 70s, maybe. And uh, no, actually, it would have been 1983. And I had just been accepted into the ministerial training program. And I was so excited, like, finally, I've arrived. And I went in, and I may have told you this story. I went in to see James Dilla Freeman because I was working in Silent Unity at that time. And he was the director of Silent Unity. And I said, uh, Mr. Freeman, Mr. Freeman, I got accepted into the ministerial program and I'm going to be a unity minister. And if you knew Jim, he was incredibly inspirational, but he was also uh, very real and very authentic and sometimes uh, a little, um, at any rate, this will explain. He, he, he's looking down and he just pulls his head up real slowly and he says, good God, isn't there anything else you can possibly do? <laughs> and of course there wasn't but um, <laughs> so it's sort of like because of that I've just always known there was never a question for me I never had a career choice I did my sixth grade career notebook on being a unity minister because <laughs> we had to tell our teacher what it is we were going to be when we grew up yeah. well I believe that that's a true calling Chris and that if it's not that calling, like we had it young, we knew already, we did our book reports. I declared it out loud when I was three years old. And I have no idea where it came from other than this almighty divine essence, the, whatever was I was impressed with in the incarnation itself. And I absolutely believe that people like this that would try to talk us out of it are caring for us, that they had a clue about the arena we were stepping into uh, that had already been around the mul mulberry bush a time or two. And one of my, Jack, Reverend Jack Poole, who's passed now, <laughs> took, took me by the arm, squeezed my arm. <laughs> look at me, look at me, he said. He went, don't do it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, come on, Jack, you must be kidding. <laughs> like, of course I have to do it. Of course I have to do it. And he was caring for me. Yeah. Um, um, so there was no absence of that. And it had to be done. It had to go the way it did. 
Well, what I didn't realize then that I most certainly realize now is that you don't become a minister for the benefit of anyone but yourself. And what you're really signing up for is not a career in altruistic service. You're signing up for the advanced class in looking yourself smack dab in, in your own face, dealing with your own, you know what, and uh, boy, I did not realize that. You know, I mentioned just a moment ago that uh, my prayer in the early 1980s was to be a great spiritual leader. I don't know if I put it that way, but that was the prayer. Dear God, make of me a great spiritual leader. I said repeatedly since then to people, don't ever pray that prayer because it is not going to, uh, well, and don't pray it unless you want to go through what I went through, which was ultimately a very fast track of peeling away. It's never ended, but initially it was very rapid, peeling away every level and layer of what I thought myself to be, um, and then standing there raw, exposed, vulnerable, um, and subject to all manner of analyzation, critique, <laughs> and editorial, and you know, I wouldn't trade it for the world, but it is, it is a fast track. So I think it really accelerates when you say, I want to be a minister, the universe says, okay. Here, and, and everything's a curriculum. So don't mistake the curriculum that's called curriculum for your curriculum. So that it's a life curriculum. So I feel like we may want to link this podcast in and this video in for the people that are applying this week to start their ministry. <laughs> Oh, here's two more trying to talk us out of it. Yeah, I've actually had people get upset with me for, uh, you know, in their enthusiasm, just like I was, I probably, to be honest, a little upset with Jim Freeman all those years ago, because I'll tell him the same thing. You know, if you feel guided, follow it. Only if you, it's only really if there is nothing else you can do, follow it. But don't expect it to be a, a, a path of you know, lilies and lilacs, and it will have, it will have, it will be an intense fast track to uh, self-awareness. Yes, and to the full spectrum. The full spectrum. The full spectrum. And, and, and really having to own ourselves, oh, you know, having to own ourselves and own our experience and completely liberate ourselves from victimization. And, you know, I'm no longer going to point any fingers out here. I'm going to really do my best to realize that all this stuff out here and what a time we're in right now for this kind of introspection, because, you know, if we can find ourselves without directing blame and persecution and condemnatory judgment and, and degrading ourselves and others, if we can do all that, this is a very rich time for such activity. Yes, and contribution and the speaking point and potential, and infinite potential. And yes. I didn't miss the word if. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. We can do this, or if we will do this, it to whatever, whatever degree, we can dial this up a notch or two. We'll yeah. see. Thank yeah. you, Chris. Um, so get, let people know as we close here, if they want to contact you, how you're serving there, like, given the church website or your email whatever you want to put on the recording just put that up here now so we will have it all right it's unity on the bay.org and i can be reached at chris c-h-r-i-s at unity on the bay.org yeah so and their their services are fantastic over the top they've got this powerful powerful team of servant-hearted people of fantastic fantastic committed group of people serving there and certainly this you Chris who is divinely appointed to lead not only them but to lead in this time and to lead in this way and I value you as a human being as a man as a leader as a colleague as a brother soul I thank you yeah and I echo that right back to you Martha I, I can't right off the top of my head pull out how many years you've been working with us but I will say that everything that I have sought to um, allow, to use our word, um, to become a part of this ministry has, uh, has been greatly influenced and enhanced by Martha Creek. 
and I am speaking on behalf of our entire spiritual community. I don't think we've ever brought anyone to our aid that everyone has loved and appreciated more than you. So um, hear those words. I know you're good at taking them in, um, but they come from the heart. You have um, supported us in, and, and empowered us to become everything that we are today. And I'm very proud and grateful for what we are today. So thank you for that. You're very, very welcome. It's my highest privilege. So you listeners know that somebody, the universe has your back and Chris and Martha are in there lifting you up, empowered and all matters of seen and unseen doing that. So you're amazing in your own way. Continue to listen, find whatever teaching that is serving you, get closer and closer and closer to the teaching, keep it alive and well. And if there's any way either one of us can serve you, get in directly in touch with us. Until we meet again, get these empowered teachings. Any way this has blessed you, send it on out into the world, send it out into the wind. So together we can do what cannot be done alone. So be it. Till we meet again. Bye for now. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Chris. MarthaCreek.com if I can support you. Blessings. <laughs>